Church and I'm part of the West Wickham congregation. And it's always good to be able to share God's word together. It's a provocation and it's an encouragement. And I was really looking forward to doing this devotional and uh, until I read the passage, Joy had warned me that it was a slightly tricky passage. That was an understatement. But we do know that all of scripture is God breathed and all of it is useful for teaching and training and rebuking, correcting and equipping, uh, equipping us and getting us ready for every work of service. So even in this passage, there is much to be gleaned. And we need to remind ourselves that the Bible doesn't shrink away from difficult subjects. In fact, uh, it tackles them head on and it reveals to us the, the true nature of God, that actually he knows absolutely everything. And we've only got a few short moments here and ordinarily I'd spend a great deal of time laying all of this out. But I simply want to say that I sense the Holy Spirit wants to remind us all over again of the beautiful, cleansing, redeeming and perfect work of Jesus. So our passage today is in Genesis 19 and we're in verse 30. But for a bit, quick bit of context, Lot and his wife had been led out of Sodom and Gomorrah with the children. Uh, the angels had led them out. Lot had managed to negotiate with the angels to go to a nearby town called Zoar instead of going all the way back to Abraham. We know Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. But the family didn't settle in this town. After all, do you really think you'd be made to feel welcome? You know, if they're the only people that survived the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and you might be inviting a similar fate to Zoar. And so we pick up this story uh, in the mountains where Lot and the two daughters are now living in a cave. And in this passage, both the daughters get their father drunk and without his consent, they sleep with him and get pregnant. First, the older daughter creates a problem. She says, our father is old and there is no man around here to give us children, as is the custom all over the earth. Who's going to continue the family line? Like suddenly this became a really big deal. Did it really matter? Did the family line have to continue? And I get that there is money and inheritances involved, but let's face it, they're living in a cave. There's not much to inherit. Having created a problem, she created the solution. She says to her sister, let's get our father drunk on wine and then sleep with him and preserve our family line. And her solution was simple. It was wrong. There's no grey area, but in her mind, the, the end goal justified it all. And then she went on to encourage her sister to do the same. Last night I slept with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again. And then you go in and sleep with him so we can preserve our family line. I don't see anything good in this story. At the end of the day, this passage is simply about justifying sin. It's what we call today rationalisation. We're all susceptible to it because, well, just by the very nature of what it is, it's sneaky and it can catch us unaware. The Bible doesn't shy away from sin. In fact, it's filled with story after story which speaks of sin. And you just got to remember the story of uh, the brothers and Joseph. They tried to kill him or David and Bathsheba. And uh, there are stories of greed and adultery and lies and betrayal. And of course, the betrayal of, of Judas as he kissed Jesus uh, in order to identify him to the Roman soldiers. But rationalisation. It's the one where we justify our behaviour and it pervades our culture. It's an easy trap to fall into. The end justifies the mean. Means our language is littered with full of phrases that reflect this attitude. You know, it's okay to let that go because, well, it's not hurting anybody, is it? Well, no one knows, so it doesn't matter. No one's going to notice. Or if it feels good, well, it can't be bad, can it? And a whole bunch of other cliches that we use to justify some pretty poor behaviour. I know when I was working with a bunch of young people who'd all committed various offences, they justified stealing with, well, they're all in shorts anyway, aren't they, Jazz? And of course, the people that would then have to go on to make those claims, well, they might exaggerate what, what's been taken because, well, I've been paying my premium for years. It's time I get something back or, well, they're going to put my premiums up next year anyway, so I might as well get all I can now. And it's easy to do. But we know that we're called to dif live differently because we have such a high calling. But we can't do this by ourselves. If we could, I suspect the world would look very different. But we can do this when we join with God, by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, I know we won't always get it right. We make mistakes. But because of Jesus and his work on the cross, we've been made brand new. We've been clothed in dignity. Our sin and our shame have been dealt with 
forever. And all of that happened in that moment when we said yes to Jesus, when we became born again, our identity changed. We make mistakes, I know, but the Holy Spirit highlights them to us and we grow a desire to change and to become more like Jesus. And sometimes this happens overnight, but more often than not, it's a process. But be assured of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion. So today, can I invite you to pause, to invite the Holy Spirit in, to fill you afresh, to help you recognise who you are in Christ and to be able to pursue your calling.